So in this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about friction because we, um, when we first start using Newton's laws and identifying forces acting on an object, um, you'll notice that a lot of times we said that there was no friction or the surface was very smooth. And what that was is it was just allowing us to simplify the scenario so it was a little easier for us to solve. Once we get used to ignoring friction, then we have to recognize that it exists and we have to learn how to deal with it. So let's talk a little bit about those frictional forces. So in this picture, we have this lady, she's trying to push a box and there's a couple different forces that are labeled that are acting on the box. There's the weight of the box that acts straight down. There's the normal force that the, is the force of the floor that pushes up on the box. There's the force that she's pushing with that you can see right there. And then finally, there's a, an arrow at the bottom. That arrow is the frictional force. So what you, what's happening right now is the woman, she's pushing the box along. And so she's exerting a force on the box, but because the ground is not perfectly smooth, there's a frictional force that's acting against her desired direction of motion. So there's two pieces of information in that scenario that are important to understand. One is the direction of that force vector is parallel to the surfaces that are interacting, the bottom of the box and the floor, and also that the direction of that friction is going to be opposite either the direction of motion or the direction of impending motion because you know perfectly well that sometimes you try to push something and you can't get it going. There's still friction in that case, but it still would be in the opposite direction from the way things are gonna to start to move once they get moving. We're gonna talk about how that, mo that friction when the object won't move is different from the friction of when it's moving. So you might wonder, why do we have friction in the first place? Well. It's actually the interaction of the two surfaces. So in this first picture, we just see a box sitting on a floor. And by visual inspection, we would probably find the box is relatively smooth and so is the floor. But if we were able to magnify the two surfaces, we would actually see that neither one is perfectly flat. At the microscopic level, there is unevenness and roughness of both the surfaces. And what you can see is, you know, the different surfaces are almost like teeth um, that are, you know, jagged. And you can sort of understand how they would sort of impen, uh, impede the motion, you know? Like if you're trying to move those two things against each other, they're gonna kind of catch and it's gonna make the motion a little bit more difficult. In fact, you can sort of understand why it's easier to get something moving once you push hard enough and you get it moving. It's because it really allows less opportunity for those, in the, those different rough surfaces to interlock, which they are doing when you have the object motionless. So the overall idea is the reason that we have friction is because of the interaction at you know, a microscopic level between the two surfaces. There are two types of motion that we experience. Kinetic motion is basically when we have, kinetic friction is actually when there's motion. So we have kinetic friction if things are moving. Um, and we say then we have the force of kinetic friction. So this expression right here is the force of kinetic friction what I want to sort of point out is that Greek letter there is the Greek letter mu. And it's the coefficient of kinetic friction. So it's a constant, it's always gonna be less than one. 
And the coefficient of kinetic friction is a value that is going to be characteristic of the surfaces that are interacting. So for instance, you would have a different coefficient of kinetic friction. Oh, I need the K to make it kinetic. You would have a different coefficient of kinetic friction if you were talking about a ball interacting with the grass as opposed to a ball interacting with the pavement. You know that it's going to be easier to move with the pavement, therefore the coefficient of friction is going to be smaller. Again, I just want to remind you that these coefficients are always going to be less than one regardless of what they are. You can see in this expression that the force of friction is equal to that coefficient times the normal force. And so if you imagine an object sitting on the ground, you know that there's the normal force and the force of the weight. And so often, these two are going to be equal and opposite. So a lot of times, the normal force will be equal to the weight. But not always. For example, you might have a scenario where you're also applying a force downward on the box. And so when you were looking at the forces in the y direction, and they add up to be zero because this object is not moving in the y direction, I'd have normal minus mg minus p equals zero. And so it would actually turn out that your normal force would be equal to mg plus p. And so I do want you to avoid the common mistake to say that the normal force is always equal to the weight. It really, the normal force is a reactive force that is reacting to how hard the object is being pushed into the surface. A lot of times it's just being pushed into the surface by the weight, but sometimes there's some other force, like someone sitting on the box or pushing down on the box, or even pulling up with a rope is going to affect how big that normal force is. And so, yes, weight will play a role, but it's not going to be the only answer. Static friction is a little bit different. Now, there is a coefficient of static friction. You can see right here, it's mu sub s. Um, in general, for a scenario, the coefficient of static friction is going to be bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. And if you think about sort of your common everyday experiences, that might make sense. For instance, let's say that you're moving into your dorm room and you had a lot of stuff in a box, and you want to just move it to the other side of the room, so you just want to slide it. And you might just start pushing on that box, and it's kind of hard to get it moving. And so you push a little harder and a little harder, and it's not moving. But then you really give it a good shove, and then it starts sliding across the floor. Once you get it moving, it seems like you don't have to push as hard as you did to get it moving, and that's absolutely correct. We'll see a graph where we can actually see that in a moment. But it's important to understand that part of the reason is because the coefficient of static friction is always going to be bigger than the force of the coefficient of kinetic friction. There's something also kind of weird here where you can see that instead of a equality set says the force of static friction is equal to the coefficient times the normal, it's less than or equal to that. And that's kind of interesting, and we'll look at that at the end of the video in more detail with some numbers. The idea being that the force of static friction is only as big as it needs to be in order to keep the object from moving. And so thinking back to that example of pushing against the, the box, trying to move it across my dorm room, when I push just a little bit, let's say I push with a force of 5 newtons, it wasn't enough. The force of static friction only had to be 5 newtons because those two forces then would be equal and opposite and it wouldn't move. But if I start pushing with a force of 8 newtons, it's still not moving. That means in that case that the force of static friction would have to be 8 newtons. So you see where I'm going with this? As I push a little bit harder, 
the force of static friction can actually change. Now, what happens when I get it moving is I reach the maximum that the force of static friction can have. The biggest it can ever be is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal. So let's say that was 10 newtons. If I push with 10 newtons, it didn't move, but then all of a sudden I pushed with 11 newtons and it starts to slide because the force of static friction had an upper cap on how big it could be, that was 10 newtons. Once I exerted a force greater than that, it started to move, and then the force of kinetic friction would take over, which would be lower because of this fact. Here's a nice graph that sort of illustrates this idea of how the force of static friction changes as we apply forces, and then also how it's bigger at its maximum value than kinetic. So in this graph, the um, vertical axis is the force of friction, and then this horizontal axis is the force that, um, that we would be applying. And so what we see here in this region is you, you can see that this is like a one-to-one -one relationship where it's actually saying that as I apply a force and the object isn't moving, the force of static friction and the applied force are gonna be exactly the same. And this continues up until the maximum value that the, friction, the static friction can have, which is the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Remember, that's the biggest it could be we had seen this expression, the force of static friction was less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And then, because the coefficient of static friction is bigger than the kinetic, what happens when you reach the maximum static frictional force and you push a little harder, now we enter into the scenario where things are moving. And so the kinetic region or the time when the force of kinetic friction is, t is acting takes over. And you can see that then the force of friction is just gonna be relatively just flat because it's always gonna be equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times whatever the normal force is. And so I like this graph because I think it visualizes what we experience with st static friction and kinetic friction. Finally, I just wanted to illustrate what I had been talking about with some numbers. The idea of, you know, what if I'm pushing on a box? So I'm going to have a box. And let's say that the mass of the box is 10 kilograms. Oops. Drew that too, too high. 10 kilograms, the coefficient of static friction is, I'm going to just say is 0.5. Now, I'll say the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.25. So you can see absolutely less than static friction. So the force of static friction is going to be equal to, or less than or equal to, the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Now, in my scenario, I'm going to have the normal force, the weight, the friction, and then someone pushing. So those are the forces that are acting on this object. When I look at the forces in the y direction, those add up to be zero. And I have normal force minus mg is equal to zero. And so the normal force is always equal to the force due to gravity. So that's always going to be my normal force. Now, the largest that this can be then is going to be minus, is going to be 0 0.5 times 10 times 9.8 because the normal force is equal to the weight. So it's gonna be um, 49 newtons. It's gonna be 
the largest that um, the frictional force can be. So let's say what happens if I apply forces of different values. What if P is equal to 10 newtons? Well, then I have P minus the force of static friction. Well, what would that be? Well, it's less than the 49 newtons, and so this object can't move because the force of static friction can go up to 49 if I only push with 10 newtons. So we know it's not gonna move, and so from this, the force of static friction is equal to P, and it's gonna be equal to 10 newtons. So you might be confused because you say, well, why isn't it 49? If I use this expression and I said 10 here and 49 here, I would get a negative number, and it would actually indicate that the friction was pushing this box backwards, which we know isn't gonna happen. And we can keep doing this if we do P equals 15, the force of static friction is gonna be 15. And we can go all the way up to 49 newtons. Even if P is equal to 49, then the static friction is equal to 49 newtons. And it's only when P is greater than 49 will we get past the static friction and then we will actually have so like as P equals 50 newtons, then I have P minus the force of kinetic friction is equal to the mass times acceleration. So in that case, once I exceed the force that the static friction can offer in resistance, that means that now I will have motion and it also will mean that um, these two forces won't be equal and opposite to each other, but the frictional force will sort of slow down the effect of the push that I have. So instead of getting an acceleration that is reflective of a 50 Newton force, it's gonna be smaller and it's gonna be, um, so this will end up being 50 minus 0 0.25 times 98 because that is mg and that'll be equal to my mass times my acceleration. And so you're actually gonna get an acceleration this time. And the other important thing is to understand that the force of friction that's going to be acting in this situ situation is the kinetic friction. So again, what I wanted to emphasize is that the static friction stays equal to the applied force up until it reaches its maximum value. Once you exceed the maximum value, the static friction isn't acting anymore and we're transitioning into motion and using kinetic friction.